You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. Whether it's for food, fuel, drinks, or snacks, about half of the U.S. population shops at a convenience store every day. We'll talk about what we see at stores and what the future may hold for our industry. Well, this show is all about convenience, but we don't only talk about convenience at convenience stores. Today, we're going to talk about the noun convenience and how retailers in all channels are exploring and becoming more convenient. Welcome to Convenience Matters. I'm Carolyn Schneer with Nax. And I'm Chris Blazinski with Nax. Well, today we welcome back a guest who has been with us on the show many, many times. And most recently, although several months ago, back in March of this year, uh, he joined us. And so we welcome Kevin Koop, who is the content guy and editor for MorningNewsBeat.com. And he covers all things retail. So welcome back, Kevin. Thrilled to be here. Um, you know, it's amazing. Yeah. March seems like a decade ago. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, it's March 27th. Like, where were we then? What were we thinking way back um, then? <laughs> uh, well, we certainly weren't thinking that by the time um, that by the next, if we talked at the end of the year that, you know, more than 300,000 people would be dead and that, that you know, um, and that the world would not have made major strides uh you know, in terms of dealing with the pandemic until certainly a couple of weeks ago when the vaccine started to be uh, distributed. I don't think any of us would have believed that oh, things no. have taken the turn, no. the, the, the turn that they have. But I'm really glad I'm saying that at the end of 2020, I'm going to try <laughs> not to be uh, depressed. Uh, we got a new <laughs> year. 2020 is in the rearview mirror, uh, pretty much. And so uh, I'm going to try. It and can happy. only get better, right? <laughs> Well, here's my, here's <laughs> my, yes. Yeah, well, you know, I, I was thinking that in June. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. and then the thing is, is that it, it is that it, what's been interesting about the year is, and, and, and let's not suggest that any, you know, that there are, you know, a m very much positive has come out of the year, but it is a year in which, um, you know, Things did uh, some kinds of innovation uh, did take place. It was a year in which, having nothing to do, Paul McCartney decided to record an album in his barn. <laughs> it is a year. Taylor Swift did yeah, two two albums. Springsteen came out with a new album. Also record. Uh, They're all recording their barns. I think I need a barn. I'd be more creative. <laughs> so I mean, so but what's interesting about that to me is that in, in just in, as a metaphor, is that it was a time when. People tried. People and companies did try to find ways to to innovate, and um, you know it's interesting. One of the one of the th things that I've sort of concluded after the, you know ten months of this nonsense is that you know there was all this acceleration and there was all this innovation. But what was interesting about it was that the the, the people uh, and the companies that were innovating weren't necessarily thinking of it as innovation. They were thinking of it as survival. We got to right. do this. We got to, man, we don't, we've never had click and collect. We got to have click and collect because that's people don't want to come in the store. We got to do it. And they would just do it. And, and they yeah. didn't think of it in terms, because if they thought about innovation they uh, in, in being innovation in normal times, they would have said, oh, we got to have a committee and we got to, you know, we're going to run it through our, our bureaucratic whatever. And it'll take, you know, 18 months to decide whether or not to do it. And we'll put it out to bid. And, and by the time they did that, all the computer, uh, you know, Amazon would have stolen their business because they just had to move so quickly to kind of keep up with where the customer was and was going they only a lot of companies innovated really fast which is a a, a really wonderful thing when you think about but it but then there's those that that didn't right there's a lot of bad stories about those that didn't keep up right well yeah i mean if you were in the supermarket business you you know it was a, it was actually a pretty good year because all, as long as you could bring product in the back door, all you had to do was open the front doors, and you were gonna you were gonna right. sell stuff, right? Um, uh, the hardest part was keeping the shelves filled, not not finding customers and not selling stuff. Um, what was it, you know it was the um, you know supermarkets. There are a lot of them out there who just have had the, had the best quarters of their lives. Um, now there are a bunch of those companies that are thinking to themselves, oh man, how great is this? I am so smart because we just had the best quarters of our lives. You know, it's, it's, uh, it, you know, it's the it's like the old story of the guy who was born on third base but thinks he hit a triple. Well, no, no, that's not the way it really worked. Um, you know, and the challenge to them is going to be 
how do they maintain their momentum as opposed to being complacent? And there will be companies that will be that will be complacent going forward, and and they're not not going to last. You know, if you were in the restaurant business, you were screwed. I mean, you just had. I mean, it's what it's hundreds of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people uh, are unemployed. Um, so many restaurants have closed. I mean, the estimates are something like 80 percent of the restaurants in the U.S. have closed down and may not come back. I mean, that's um, enormously depressing. Um, you know, and as I understand it, and this is your more your bailiwick than mine, I mean, the convenience store industry was sort of a mixed bag. They, they were able to continue doing business, as I understand it, although sales were off and a lot of it depended on location and, and format and things like that. Is that, is that yeah. a fair reading of it? Well, in some respects, though, for the ones who – we say had innovated, is it also maybe a little more fair to say that they actually just got off the fence? Because there was, you know, when you mentioned like click and collect and things like that, now there was a demand that it's almost like they were waiting for in order to to bring these types of, you know, things to customers, like to see them actually happen and bring them into fruition before there might, you know, the pandemic didn't, we didn't have that demand for people who, you know, we're working from home or whose kids were not in school. Well, true. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think, I, I suppose that's fair. I do think that, you know, the, the problem with saying, well, I'm going to wait for the demand is sometimes if you wait too long, if you spend too much time on the fence, you, you find that when the demand is created, the, it's the companies who got there first, um, have kind of created the value proposition that it's appealing to pe- that is appealing to people gets their first, and then you're and then you're starting from a, um, a, a from a from a stopped position, if you will, um, as opposed to having de- developed momentum and had and kind of laying in the infrastructure. Um, you know, it's I've been arguing for years that the any store that sort of was under construction, but that at least was not, but that was not laying the pipe for things like click and collect and, and staging for online orders and delivery and all those sorts of things. Um, and again, it depends on the format um, and, and, and the side of the business. But if you weren't doing those things four and five years ago, even though the, you know e- e-commerce was not certainly as big as it is today, you were simply making a mistake and potentially creating a, a, a store that was going to be obsolete and very hard to retrofit. Um, so I, 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 I think that I think that the retailers who said, "Well, I'm, I'm going to wait for I'm going to wait until there's enough uh, volume." To, to, to justify it, you know, really did run the risk of, of, of waiting too long. Now, the, the counter side of that, of course, is that they had to move really, really fast uh, because of the pandemic. Um, so maybe they made up some of that time. You know, I think one of the things is, as a from the consumer standpoint that I thought of is like, you know, when when the, you your favorite convenience store or your favorite um, even restaurant would have an app like the QR codes are huge now. You walk into a restaurant um, and or at least their patio, and they right. show you a QR code and there's your menu. And I think that's brilliant. And it's something like, man, I wish they did this many, many years ago. And I hope this sticks around where after a while back, you know, back in the day or, you know, March, I would have been like, okay, click done. Now I'm like, oh, I guess I should just download the app. This isn't going away. So <laughs> like now, yeah. now I'm in the same spot where I'm, I've got my app load on my phone. I've probably tripled the number of convenience stores, restaurants and store apps that I have because I'm like, well, this isn't going away. So I might as well jump all the way in myself and get involved. So I would imagine a lot of the stores that do have, whether it's online ordering or just an online presence through an app of some sort or through the roof, I think everybody has some kind of footprint now. And if you don't, you know, you might not be there next year. I, I hope for their sake, but you know that you, you need to have at least an online presence. At the very well, and the, and the other implications are: remember, if you're a restaurant and now you're you're, uh, I'm able to I'm, I'm looking at the menu via a QR code uh, on my smartphone. It also allows you to do things like be a lot more nimble in terms of changing your menu. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, if you if suddenly you can be in a, in a um, you can come at the business in a different kind of way. Um, and, 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 and react faster to product availability. Oh, we just got a great shipment of, of, uh, the salmon. So let's, let's change up the menu tonight, as opposed to having to live with whatever you printed up and maybe, and having the, the server read out specials, um, yeah. which has always been an awful part of the experience anyway. 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, struggle through. Right. Oh, well, and, I'll yeah. memorize that this morning. And, yeah, and now so, you get to do it through a mask. It's like, and you're like, what? I don't know what I you're saying. I do that before. And trust me, it sucks. <laughs> yeah. Well, and hopefully, listen, hopefully a year from now, you know, we will not all be wearing masks. I mean, we're, you know, um, there is, uh, you know, I mean, I, it's hard to judge. Uh, okay, I'm going. I'm going into 2020 mode as opposed to 2021 mode here. It's hard to know how. Even though there is, you know, there's now, you know, as we record this, there's there's two vaccinations out there. There will be more. Um, it's going to be a matter of you know getting it into people's arms. But there's still a significant percentage of the population that doesn't trust it, doesn't want to do it for a lot of different reasons. Um, some of it socioeconomic, some of it political. Um, and I think that, so we don't really know, um, exactly, you know, if, if, if we're able, if we have the capacity to, and, and I say we, like I'm giving out the shots, right? I'm not giving, I, 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 um, <laughs> yeah. You wear a lot of hats, don't you? Yeah, step, <laughs> step, step into, into my office. I give you a shot. Um, <laughs> if the, um, um. If if we're able to if we have the capacity to to vaccinate everybody by June first or July first or whatever it happens to be, there's no guarantee that we will have an inoculated enough people for it to make a difference. Um, which I know is the big concern that 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 Dr. Fauci has is that enough people not enough people are going to say yes, which creates a really interesting challenge for retailers. So you know, let's suppose it's March first, twenty twenty one. And you're a, you know, you're a convenience store retailer or you're a, you know, a drugstore or a restaurant or a supermarket. How long do you keep your mask mandate? You know, do you continue to mandate masks? Do you continue to, um, you know, really try to as best possible regulate the whole notion of physical distancing? I say that instead of social distancing because I hate that term. Um, <laughs> you know, do you try and keep the, your one way aisles as a way of giving people space? I mean, at what point? Because we are all worn out by this. We're all exhausted. And, and I think retailers are going to be facing some you know, tough decisions where people are, people who will get the shots will say, I don't have to worry about this anymore. Well, in fact they do. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, this, cause the science is, um, the science is so, you know, in some ways imprecise on some of these things and we're, and they're learning all the time. So I think, I think it's going to be an interesting challenge for retailers as they go forward. And what I really, and what I think in a lot of ways is going to happen is they're, they're going to have to really do a good job of messaging. They're going to have to really do a good job of communicating with their customers and telling them the story to the point of saying, we know you're tired of this, but we're trying to follow, you know, best practices from the CDC. We're trying to um, do the best thing. So by, you know, Labor Day, nobody has to wear a mask anymore, you know, but it's going to be, it's going to be a hard one. Yeah. So, and it'll depend on counties too. You know, you could have it, the counties will pretty much dictate how that goes, which is well, unfortunate if you're, if you're a 600, 500 store operator, multiple States, multiple counties, like all those regulations get really messy, really fast. Yeah. It's, it's so hard and, 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 you know, and who knows what things will, I mean, Regardless of your p political perspective, we know things are going to change on January 21st. There will be a, 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 so who knows what the politics, well, we know what the politics of it are going to be. Who knows what the government of it is going to be and how that's going to change. Um, and I think, so yeah, but you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. It is easier. I'm totally sympathetic to, to the, to the retailers who said, could you just, who didn't want to be in the position of having to pol make the rules and police them that they, mm -hmm. that they said, listen, if the County or the town or the state would just say, these are the rules, we'll follow them. We'll follow the rules, even if we hate them, but don't put us in the position where we have to, you know, be judge and jury with our customers who we're, we're trying to make happy. Um, yeah. That's a really, that's a, that's a hard position to be in. Yeah, oh, yeah, Absolutely. So I'm going to take a take a fast forward because I think um, we all want to fast forward in some way. And I'm going to go even like pretty far into the future. Now we're going to let's go into this time next year. You were talking about March of 2021, which was a full year after when we last spoke. Right. Let's go at Christmas time, holiday time of 2021. So let's assume that 
this pandemic is mostly behind us. It, you know, we, we don't have to wear masks. We can kind of be normal per what normal, I don't even know what normal is, but what it was last year. So what kind of innovations that you've heard about? Now, I'm almost sick of the word carry out delivery, all that other stuff, because it's it's become that same phrase um, bucket of, of dumpster fire of words, right? <laughs> like We're all in this together and, you know, that stuff. And then we talk about carry out delivery. I just like, it, it's like, stop saying those words, come up with a new term. What besides that, though, what what things do you think will be sticking around or what do you hope sticks around um, after this is all done in terms of technology or ways of doing things in the retail world? I don't think there's any question that e-commerce is going to continue to, I mean, is it, I mean, while it is, it is accelerated to a certain point, it'll, it, we'll see some backing off of it a little bit because people will want to go to the store. Um, and so, but I do think that e-commerce people have learned that there's things, uh, you know, that they can do things a lot more easily, either by having it delivered or click and collect or whatever it happens to be. And they've learned that there's a lot of items out there for which it does not make a difference, right? It, there's a lot of packaged products where it does not matter if I go to the store. There is no advantage in doing that. That said, I think there will be, there will be companies that will, that will say, Hey, listen, let's, and I may, this may be accelerating me way past 2021, we may be talking even further beyond that. But I do think there'll be retailers that will say, hey, listen, we need to create a retail env uh, environment where the physical pre the physical plant are the things that differentiate us as opposed to the thing that, things that make us the same. And so I do think you're going to see stores, um, and this I'm talking specifically about the grocery sector, but I think that there'll be some, there'll be convenience stores that will get into this game as well because they need to uh, attract, um, you know, customers um, that will have, you know, you know, produce and deli and meat and seafood and bakery and with some convenience oriented, this is, you know, the convenience oriented grocery products. But by and large, if you want to buy, you know, Cheerios, Oreos, Tide, um, you know, that I can do online. And I can either have it shipped to my house or I can pick it up while I'm there because there, there's no advantage for me in um, – in going through the, in going through the, uh, uh, in going to the physical store for that. So I think we're going to see uh, more of that. I, you know, I do think we're going to see an, a, a kind of a new format. Everybody likes to talk about, um, you know, grocerants, which are, you know, grocery stores that have developed um, a style of restaurant uh, inside their stores. So the, so restaurant, you know, quality food, um, which I guess is a good thing if you like the restaurant. If it's a crappy restaurant, that's not such a good thing. But that's a different story, <laughs> different conversation. Um, but I also think what you might see is you might begin to see um, uh, restaurant markets that'll take it from the opera, uh, other way. Maybe there'll be restaurants that will either reopen or open anew that'll say, "Hey, listen, instead of having a fifty-seat restaurant with a tradition with a traditional, you know, offering." Uh, depending on whatever the cuisine happens to be, hey, maybe we're only going to have a 10 seat restaurant or a 20 seat restaurant, but we're also going to have, we're going to have a much more robust um, uh, takeout business and we're going to have a small market. And so we're going to be able to sell for people to make at home, whether via just the ingredients or meal kits or whatever it happens to be. So if people want to have this experience uh, at home, and they don't want to come to the restaurant for whatever reason, having nothing to do with pandemic, they can do that. And I, so I think you'll start to see some new formats like that pop up. You know, I think that, um, I think you're, pro I would, I would guess that, um, you might see, and I'm not sure it's, you would technically call them food trucks, but I do think you're going to see some burgeoning in that sector in, in terms of those, you know, almost pop up restaurants that don't require the whole, you know, the whole big kitchen, the whole, you know, and a, and a, and a three page menu and, and a 40 page wine list. It's going to be a different kind of approach because people are going to realize you know, what a, what a, what a revenue, uh, uh, challenge model that is and how much money you got to put into it. And, and they're going to be looking for different, I mean, the people's desire to eat out is not going to, it will, will come back, 
I, I, you know, I don't th- have any question about that. And people's desire to try new foods is are, are will come back and to be waited on and to be taken care of. But I do think that that um, you know the restaurant industry is going to look at what just happened and say, well, maybe there was something wrong with the business model. So you're going to see maybe a different sort of approach um, to the restaurant business, which is also going to be very convenience oriented because they're going to offer you the option: you want to eat it here, you want to take it home. What do you want? How do you want to make that work? Um, so I think you're going to see a lot of um, innovation that way. Uh, you know, when you look at other other you know uh, other channels, um, you know, God, I don't, I have no idea what's going to happen to the, happen to the movie theater business. I, I mean, it's just yeah. so hard to imagine it coming back um, after people have gotten used to being able to watch Wonder Woman's for on first release on their TVs at home. You know, I mean, I think that some of it will come back, but it's really hard to imagine. I always tell people, you know, I, you know, I love movies. Wrote a book, wrote a book about the movies. I was a film student when I went to college. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. and I, um, I, I, I see, you know, in the theater, um, I would see, you know, it sounds like a lot, thirty to thirty-five movies a year, which is, you know, a, a, a way higher than the the average American. I've been seeing that in the last ten years. <laughs> I, oh, know. I had I had a year in nineteen. I think it was nineteen eighty eighty one, where I actually saw one hundred and fifty movies in theaters. Oh, oh my, my gosh! gosh. Um, well, it didn't cost sixteen dollars to no, go to a movie. No, but I wasn't making very much money then either. That's I was funny. taking a film class, and I would that's that's an average of three movies a week. But I saw would see wow. double features and stuff like that. And I love movies. And if you can't get me to want to go back to the theater. And that's the, which is the way I feel right now. If you can't get me back into the theater, you got real problems because I, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm anxious for that experience. So I do think there will be that. That's just sort of a way of, of saying, you know, I think there, it will be a hangover from this pandemic. And I think people, you know, people will, you know, people are never going to be on a plane again. And the person next to them is going to sneeze without them going, oh, um, <laughs> right. I say that in my house. I, I like right. sneeze and everyone goes, oh, do you have COVID? I'm like, yeah. no, but, I hope not. You know, <laughs> um, so allowed to sneeze you know, yeah. so I, I do think that, um, you know, I, so I, I, and I think there will probably be technologies that are going to come along that will help us address some of those things. Um, um, and some of it will be low, very low tech, like, you know, God, wouldn't you wish, didn't you wish a year ago you had invested in a plexiglass company? Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Who knew? Sewing machine, Who actually, knew? I would have been right. happy with. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew that this, uh, you know, that things like plexiglass or, you know, uh, would be, um, would be, everybody would, what would, would need it and want it. Right. Um, so I think that's some of where we're going to see, I think, you know, but I do think that people, you know, the, the, I, I, and we've had this conversation before because we've talked about Amazon and we've, you know, and we talked about technology when I've, you've been kind enough to ask me in the past, you know, I really, you know, I've always resisted the notion that some people have, and I get these emails all the time, which is that somehow um, shopping in the store is morally superior than shopping online. And I've always thought that's just, that's just nonsense. I mean, first of all, I don't think that's ever an issue of moral superiority, I, and I think that, well, I don't know if I shop online, what are all the things that I'm able to do with those hours that I might have been in the store? I can read a book, go for a run. I can go to a movie. I can I can sit outside and have a drink with my wife. You know, I can I'll take the dog for a walk. I can play catch with my kids. There's a lot of things that are that are better than going shopping that online shopping allows you to do. And I think that and and I think people have come you know, to realize that. I also yeah, know, I somebody, to, um, right. I mean, I'll tell you something else. I, and here's something I was, com- uh, I was, um, uh, I've been completely wrong on. Well, I, I, we don't know if I'm completely wrong on it, but I think that I've, I, and, and who knew because the pandemic changed things, but I've been, you know, I've been for several years now and I'm not the only one doing this. It's not that I'm particularly smart. It's just that I read the right stories. Um, that I, you know, I thought that the, you know, I was sort of the the death of the suburbs, if you will. And you know that that you know that there were so many stores out there that were built for people, um, 
who would, you know, graduate from college and get married and, and then move to the suburbs and have three kids and get a minivan and they'd have a nice house with a basement and they would, you know, drive to the store, you know, one, two, three times a week. They do what they needed to do. And that was the life they lived. And, and I said, you know, that's changing because you're seeing the urbanization of America where, you know, people are, 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 get, are getting married later. Um, which means they're having fewer children and they don't want to necessarily move to the suburbs. So they're living, they're living in a more urban environment or at least a suburb with urban, um, with urban characteristics. Um, they're not living in a house necessarily with a, with a basement where they can store stuff and they may not even have a car. And so what would happen to all these stores out there, uh, that would, that were, that were built Mm -hmm. for the first group as opposed to the second group? Well, then of course the pandemic hit and everybody wanted to move to the suburbs because we all, we have yards, we have patios, Mm -hmm. we can cook outdoors and it's a, you know, so it'll be interesting to see, uh, see. And, and this is a really interesting question. If you're a, if you're a, a retailer, whether you're a, a C store operator or a drugstore operator or a supermarket, you know, if you've got an urban strategy, you know, are you in the wrong place at the wrong time? If you're, um, you know, if you are, you know, a, you know, if you're in New York City, are those people coming back? I mean, some of them are, but I don't know how many of them are. So it's, that's going to be a really interesting question that retailers are going to have to think about in terms of where where are the people going to be and and how to what degree have their habits changed? You know, and to to get towards the end of that one too, I think a lot of people are going even further than just the suburbs now. I mean, we've taken several day trips or we slow weekend trips with like an Airbnb outside of um, where my home is in Virginia out to the mountains. And you know, you cannot just out of curiosity, we're like, oh, what's for sale out here? You know, maybe we should just move out here. What the heck? I can just do virtual school from wherever. And you can't find a house for sale. They're like going like quick. So I think even to, to add to your suburban theory, I think people are going straight up to the country, maybe for a second house or maybe just to move out in general, because you can, you can still do virtual school at your favorite, you know, urban school system from, you know, the mountains, 50 miles away, hundred miles away. Well, I hope, but I hope the next time, this time next year, we're not still in virtual school. I still think, you know, no. and I, and, and I think, that, and I think yes. that the, um, <laughs> well, and it, it raises an interesting question because it seems to me that if, that, you know, those people might move to the country or they might move to the outer suburbs or the, you know, mid suburbs or whatever you want to call them. But those people who have moved are not necessarily going to say, I want to give up all of the things I got used to in the city. And that's going to create opportunities for retailers. Again, whether you're a, a you know, a C store operator, whether you're, a, you know, a supermarket, um, you know, a restaurateur, um, you know, to say, okay, we've got, we've got, we got all these people who've moved to town, but, the, you know, they're going to want some of the amenities that they were used to in the city. How do we, how do we, you know, how do we cater to that? And by the way, those same people are going to want, uh, are going to want better schools. You know, mm-hmm. uh, school districts in the country that maybe did not have the same kind of investment in the school systems that they did before may find themselves going through their own sort of revolution as right. those people say, oh, no, no, the, you know, we need to have the schools wired for Internet. We have to have this. And we we expect a certain level of of customer service, for lack of a better term. And, it, it, and that's going to be an interesting – it's going to be an interesting evolution – and I think it's in some ways it's really, really hard to predict, you know, um, and by the way, there's going to be a, you know, we have COVID-19 now we're going to have COVID-23 or COVID-25 or, or oh, something. Oh, no, you didn't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we're going to, you stop. No, no, but you know what the thing is, I mean, right, one of the things, inevitably, I mean, if nothing else, this experience should have taught us that, um, uh, wash I mean, your hands. Well, wash it, you know, it, yeah, you should wash your hands <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Um, you should wash your hands anyway. You should always have a couple of extra rolls of toilet paper and paper towel in the basement. But also, you know, you know, but it, it, seriously, you know, it's all kind of maybe is ephemeral the right word? Uh, it, you know, it's all you know. You 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 do have to sort of you know plan for a rainy day. Um, you got to have an umbrella just in case. And um, and I think that's something that retailers are going to. Um, uh, are, are going to have to kind of keep in mind going forward. But I, the, but the one thing they can't do is they can't stop innovating. 
They mm-hmm. can, they have to keep looking forward. They have to try, try to, you know, figure out where the customer is going and what they want. They got to pay attention. I mean, we'll come back to the thing you, we've always talked about here. You know, they got to pay attention to what Amazon's doing. I mean, yeah. I mean, just in the last couple of weeks, Amazon is basically, well, they haven't announced they're getting into the business, but the um, FDIC basically created new regulations that will allow Amazon and Walmart and Facebook, God help us, to get into the banking business by doing loans. Um, and Amazon announced they're going to they're going to start doing customized T-shirts, which is like I'm sitting there going, "Well, those are two different ends of the spectrum, aren't they?" Uh, <laughs> but that what it tells us is that um, they are going to continue to you know to push the limits and disrupt whatever uh, whatever segments they see as as ripe for disruption. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at the Amazon Fresh stores that are opening up. We see the Amazon Go stores. They continue to open them. Uh, they continue to, you know, they've still got Whole Foods. They're, they continue to, to, um, to tinker with the model to see what works and what doesn't. Um, and so the, the one thing that retailers, whatever segment you happen to be in, can't do is they can't, they can't relax. Right. They, they cannot relax because it's, right. you know, it's, it's going to keep, it's going to keep up. The momentum may change a little bit, but it's going to keep up. Well, and you know, when, um, just before I close here, one thing I thought of when we talked about the virtual schooling is that we have one very tech savvy group of kindergartners out there right. and everything, every grade above that. I mean, the, the way that our kids, like I've got a, um, a 12 year old, he's in sixth grade, had to learn to immediately adapt to checking email every morning, at least two, maybe even two, three times a day, two different sets of emails, mind you, as well as, you know, this and how to turn this and how to use a zoom camera and how to, it, but, and he's 12, like the, five-year-olds and six-year-olds that were in kindergarten or starting kindergarten or in first grade are doing the same thing. And these kids will someday be shoppers and they will be very savvy shoppers. And they're, they're not turning around and looking back to like, Oh, let me just walk over here and play with your clunky online system. No, they know they're going to just immediately keep scrolling to the next browser. So that is a, that is a great point. And that was, that may have been wiser than anything um, that I, that I said, um, because it, you're absolutely right. You've got all these five and six year olds who are sitting there and like, you know, um, they're capable of so much more, um, th- than we were, we were aware that my, my, my wife, I won't say her age, but she's closer to my age, um, than, uh, probably than she'd like to be. <laughs> and, um, and my daughter who's, who is, um, 26 years old and, um, you know, they're both teachers. And as they dealt with the, the kind of the whole, whole remote schooling thing, it was just so much easier for my daughter to sort of adapt to, to Zoom and, you know, yeah. you know, um, you know, all these different technologies and, 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 it's, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's very, that's well, a and, really and they have good it idea. And in a store, I mean, my nephews are little, they're five and six, and I don't think they've been in a store since this started. Their parents just do all the shopping and don't bring them anywhere. And so this is an entirely, um, a new generation that hopefully gets to experience life the way we did, but um, they're not going to movie theaters. They're not going to stores. They're not doing things like that. In fact, I'm like, hopefully they get a chance to someday, (laughs) you know, and it's just, it's very different. Chris, your nephews and niece and nephew, the same thing. They probably have a very different experience than, well, than we did growing up. That's for sure. But just the way they watch TV, which they don't watch TV, they watch shows and it's either on Netflix or YouTube kids and they're short and they don't have commercials. So you cannot, you cannot put my niece in front of a movie. She will not do it. She will tell you she hates movies. Sorry, Kevin. Well, oh, no, listen, <laughs> too I, 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 to- I totally, too long. I totally, I totally get it. My 26 year old won't watch anything in black and white. It's like, and the, <laughs> which breaks my heart, but she's, uh, I'm just not interested. Yeah, but I even remember- kind of trick her. I'm like, no, it's frozen. Yeah. It's like Elsa. I mean, it'll be over in like 30 minutes. And she, yeah. she's like, you're yeah. not telling me the truth. <laughs> <laughs> she looked well, at her I, I, or watch her Apple watch and said, yeah. well, you know what? According to this. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, you know, think about the fact that anybody, if you were born you know, if you were born, let's say, let's keep it, make it simple. If you were born anytime after the year 2000, you don't remember a world without Amazon. You don't know. It, it means nothing to you. Yeah. 
you don't really remember a world without, you don't remember a world without, without, so, certainly not without cell phones and probably without well, smartphones. Definitely without the internet. Right. Sure. I mean, you, you're, you're, and so your expectations are just entirely different. And that's something that retailers, um, really have to have to think about going forward. And I just, yeah, I, I do get tired of people, um, you know, people do, Oh, we got to get back to normal. No, you know, no. I mean, you, you know, you're, first of all, I don't even know what normal is anymore. And second of all, just, it's really important to deal with reality and figure out and, and figure out what, what is your reality. And then, um, and then work towards that. Um, can I take, sorry, can I take, can I tell you a quick story? You sure, time? quick story. Hi, so, was, okay. so, uh, so I was talking to somebody the other day who was telling me that they knew a restaurant owner, and he was actually it was a franchisee. I have no idea what the company was, um, and it was, but it was a, some sort of quick service um, restaurant that he had to close, and when all all um, uh, went all uh, you know pick up take out um, for the last six months, eight months, whatever it happens to be who told this person I know, I hope they never let us open the restaurant again. He says, mm-hmm. I can't, I'm, I'm making so much more money. Profits are up. I mean, my, my profits are up. My, you know, my expenses are way down. My volume is down, but it's a lot more profitable business. I don't mm-hmm. ever want, I, I, I hope they never allow me to open my, uh, my dining room again. Wow. And, and my, and I thought, Hey, I thought that was interesting. Um, and, and, probably an outlier in this in the in the restaurant business right now but my my second reaction to it was so why are you going to open up your 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 dining room don't let your why are you letting circumstances define you you have to define your circumstances now being a franchisee that franchisee there's probably all sorts of issues right so he can't just you know turn it into a, a takeout only thing but i would be looking you can't I take out be, a quarter of the building right. and put another dedicated drive through yeah, in there <laughs> maybe maybe not i don't know what his, the franchisee arrangement is but the point is it's really important for all of these businesses not to allow themselves to be defined by the circumstances you have to find your own circumstances. And so if you see an opportunity and you see a change, you got to go after it. And, and that's why, and, and the worst thing you can do, I think is sit on the fence and say, well, I'm going to wait. You've got to, you got to take some chances. You got to take some risks. You got to make some investments. But if you don't do those things, you're, you're at severe risk of, of, of being lapped by the competition. And, and, and that's a, I think an enormous problem um, going forward. Kevin, I don't think I could have even said it a better way to <laughs> close this close the show. I couldn't even uh, repeat what you just said. But you're right. Don't don't rest on your laurels and uh, and think of reality how you want it to be, not so much just doing things the way they've always been done. So, Kevin, thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoy talking to you. Um, every time I know we went a little longer than we do on some of our shows. So, thanks for sticking around and and continuing to listen and talk to us. And I hope it's not nine months after this and that I hope we're in a different place, but we'd love to have you back on the show. Anytime. And yes, I hope, I hope the next time that we're not in the middle of a pandemic, but you know something, <laughs> if, we, if we are, I'm home. I got nothing else to do. Love to talk to you. <laughs> That's true. We'll just be like, I look at COVID 27. No, just kidding. Well, anyway, thank you for your time today. And thank you for listening to Convenience Matters. Convenience Matters is brought to you by Nax and produced in partnership with Human Factor. For more information, visit convenience.org.